Angelisa. I'm the director of the University Galleries. It's a pleasure to see everyone here for this talk about Armando Gear's work. I just want to start by saying a few thank yous. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank Armando um, for working with us to realize this exhibition. It's been a true pleasure um, to have this dialogue um, in the selection of work, in the layout of the show. Um, it's really been a fascinating journey um, that I'm very grateful to have been part of. Um, and I'm so glad that he's here with us today to share with us more about his artwork, um, which I know has already um, attracted much interest um, from the students and faculty um, and our other gallery visitors. Um, I also want to thank um, Giandi Pavon, who helped us with the installation of the exhibition, um, who's not here today. I want to thank um, Emily Johnson, the gallery manager. I want to thank Alejandro um, Andreas, who introduced me to Armando's work, so it's a very important introduction. And I want to thank the faculty who um, have um, kindly brought their classes with us today, Professor Elaine Lorenz, um, Professor Juan Robles, and Professor Tom Uline. Um, so, I'm going to start by reading um, Armando's bio. Um, the format for our talk today is I'm going to have a, a kind of a short, sorry, is this too loud? No, we couldn't hear you at the back. Okay, sorry. I'm gonna have a, a, a little bit of a conversation with um, Armando, ask him a few questions about his work, and then Armando's gonna show us uh, presentation. Um, he has a whole new body of work that he's working on, so I'm excited for him to share that with you. Um, um, and then there'll be time for questions and answers, because I'm sure you all have um, very good questions. Um, so um, Armando was born in Havana, Cuba in 1961. He initially studied mechanical engineering at the Institute of Technology in Santiago de Cuba. In 1987, he received his bachelor's degree with a specialization in sculpture from the San Alejandro Academy of Fine Arts in Havana. After immigrating to the United States, he worked for more than a decade as a mechanical engineer, designing parts and processes for General Motors and Cadillac, um, as well as other companies, and he also worked internationally. Um, since 2000, he has pursued a career full-time as an artist, um, he's exhibited his work at the Dactyl Foundation in New York, at Lehman College Art Gallery in New York City, among others. His works is, uh, are also in numerous private collections in Florida, in New York, Ohio, and also internationally in France and Mexico. Recently, he's been using a CNC mill and a 3D printer in his own studio, in his own, to create his newest series of works um, titled The Euclidean Works. Um, which are inspired by the golden ratio. And he's gonna talk a little bit about that um, after our conversation. Um, so um, so um, I just have a few questions that we're gonna start by talking about. Um, so th there are no surprises. <laughs> Um, so, um, one of the first things I thought would be interesting for you to explain to us is about your interest in combining different materials, um, whether it be combining paint and wood, or metal and wood, and I'm interested in the juxtaposition of those two different materials in the sense that wood is organic and metal is um, man-made and has an industrial quality. So maybe if you could talk about bringing those two types of materials together. Oh, yes, uh, uh, all this uh, series of uh, spirals and helices, uh, especially this uh, series of helices, I combine both materials uh, uh, mainly because the way uh, the wood makes it very light and the, it still brings some reflections of the idea that I want to show, that is the basically the concept of the helix and the spirals. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the color of the, I, I didn't color of the, any of those uh, woods, I just uh, laser cutter and preserve the coloration that, of the burning of the laser. And the other parts are cut with a <clears throat> laser too, but leave it just as they are. Thank you. Um, 
can you tell us a little bit about um, the research that you do um, to create your artwork? Um, I, I mentioned Euclid. I know Newton is also important to you, so maybe you can share how that philosophy informs your work. And normally, uh, my research started years quite before I start doing something. But um, after I have the idea that I'm going to work with, I concentrate and find the best material and the best technology that are going to help me to represent that idea. Um, but uh, in the conceptual part, it takes me quite a long time to come with something that I want to build. But after that, that's the longest part of the research. I just pick a, the right material or what I think going to be more appropriate to build that form that I have in mind. Um, so after you do that research, um, do you have a schematic of what the final piece is going to look like? Are there changes that happen along the way, or is it is it the research <coughs> dictates and the end result matches it? Or? And normally, I start with a very good idea of what I'm going to to do. However, in the process, there is many changes. That I start with an idea, and I never know how I'm going to end. However, uh, during the modeling process, I use uh, parametrics to model my work. I sometimes implement change in the way that I didn't preview before. Um, that is a, a, well, many artists say that there is no accidents in art, that you should, the accident is something that should apply very good to the idea that you work in. Um, uh, when those things happen, I really love to leave the, uh, those accidents in my work. For example, here you can see that there is a missing piece of wood, and I never try to fill that, or <coughs> so it's that piece full because it was no attached to the structure, I just leave it like that. Because uh, uh, for me, this is uh, more like a, I want to show the history of the material and the process more than manipulating something. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, no, it does. You mentioned par parametrics. Is that a software, computer software? No, parametric is a, a, a way to model. A, for example, a SketchUp is a, a program where you can create forms, however, it's not parametric because it doesn't recognize all points in the space. A, a parametric program uh, knows all the points on the space and in the volume that you're creating, but not only that, he knows the density, um, moments of inertia, and many other information that is inclusive. Uh, is the the most uh, close scene to reality. It's a virtual reality, but very close, because when I finish the model, I know the way, how the, the, the part gonna lay, and what is the center of gravity, and many other uh, uh, aspects that you don't get from a simple a SketchUp or AutoCAD drawing. So is that um, software that you used as an engineer in your career before? That's correct. That, uh, I, I came in, uh, familiar with this uh, software. I use SolidWorks, basically. Um, it's something that I brought from my engineering experience to uh, a sculpture. Thank you. Um, can you give us an idea of, of the amount of time you take to create your work from the stages of conception to research and design and... Well, uh, it, it's a, the time is varies completely from one piece to the other one, especially the 
because you have to consider the scale, mm -hmm. the materials that are you using, uh, and the technology available to you. Uh, for example, if you're cutting by hand, you are not as fast as if you're cutting in a machine. Um, is the is the pieces small? You probably gonna end it up with a with a product before a large piece or a, a, a complicated piece. Uh, also, the geometry when it's a complex takes uh, more time to put it together than simple things. Thank you. Um, another question I wanted to ask you is um, if you had no limits, no boundaries, what is a dream project? If budget was no limit, your space or location, oh. what, what is the biggest thing you would like to do? Well, David, that probably won't fit here. <laughs> no, I, 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 I love, uh, my dream is uh, basically more than a, a, a specific project. I, I, my dream is to create a volume of work that can inspire new generations to keep working and investigating and creating uh, in the same way in the same way that happens to me when I was in front of the Bonarotis Davy or uh, the endless column from Bracuzzi. So can you tell us you just mentioned one artist uh, other artists that you like to be compared to? Or well, uh, I don't know if I can be compared to them, but uh, there is a, at least three artists who have been very influential in my work. Um, I will start with Brancusi. Uh, Constantine Brancusi, uh, I think it was from Romani, I guess, and his background was from uh, like a farmer. He also was uh, the assistant to a famous uh, French sculptor called Auguste Rodin. Is that correct? So <clears throat> uh, it's funny that one, one day uh, Rodin uh, stepped into his studio and he finds a note from Brancusi that says, uh, Master, I have to leave because nothing grows under a big tree. So he, he, he applied one of those parabolas from the farms. But he, he, after that, he was the, the first person that told me that a sculpture doesn't have to be representative or figurative. Uh, and the endless column is a, a, a tremendous uh, lesson about modular uh, composition. The other artist, I would say, will be um, Eduardo Chillida. He's a, a Spanish sculptor. He's no, uh, well known as a Brancusi, but still, <coughs> I'm sorry, his uh, pieces uh, bring a, a tremendous uh, symbolism that I uh, completely capture me. Um, <coughs> The last one is uh, somebody from the area, uh, Sandy, Alexander uh, Calvo. Mm. He used to live in, he was born in Lawton, Pennsylvania, and I was born in Lawton, Havana, Cuba. <laughs> he studied engineering, I studied engineering. We, we had some similar, but he was the, uh, uh, credited because uh, he creates the, the mobile in a sculpture. The, the first kinetic uh, sculptures have been uh, designed by him. And that was very influential for me. <clears throat> um, yeah, no, I can see that connection to Calder's work, and especially in your interest in the very bold colors, and, and he worked a lot in primary colors, and correct. your interest in balance. Um, That's correct. He, he had a lot of suspended pieces that the balance, in a very delicate balance, that any breeze or flow of air uh, move them uh, in a very beautiful way. 
And, and he also started as a mechanical engineer. He studied at Stevens Institute of Technology, which isn't very far That's from here. That's correct. That's he, in, he in New Jersey. My house. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm just going to ask one more question. Um, can you tell us, um, as an artist, what is the best advice you've ever received? As an artist. Uh, well, I have a, when I was a, a starting my a courses of a sculpture, uh, <clears throat> I start drawing and making models from, from reality, copying reality, <clears throat> and things like that. But one day, uh, there's a side was a three composition, and my teacher saw me meditating and a little bit this is uh, <coughs> afraid of a pile of a, a clay that I have in front of me to do something um, he went around and around and finally he told me uh, the muses only come when they see you working so you have to move you have to start and inspiration will come today I can tell you that inspiration is the pro, the, is the, the windfall of hardware. That is its inspiration. Inspi you don't see it, and inspiration comes. You work, and inspiration comes. That's it for me. That's my mantra. I, I, I work first, and after I line it all with the idea that I, I have in mind, but I have to move. Hachon is very important. Great. Okay. Thank you. Same. Also, I want to say thank you to Kristen, um, uh, Joseph Moore, the dean, because this uh, is such a beautiful program uh, for um, a local artists. Uh, I tell you the truth. Uh, I, I will be a, a little bit uh, far away if I have this kind of program when I was uh, studying art. That's a that's a very good for for students. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so um, now we're going to switch gears, and Armando's going to show us a presentation with more images of his work. So I'm going to try and turn off my microphone. I have a new <coughs> uh, body of work that I call. Euclidean works uh, uh, because I was uh, studying Euclid's uh, actions when this uh, series uh, was born. Um, I don't know if you heard about Euclid. The, the, the name probably uh, most people doesn't know the name Euclid. However, uh, everybody that went to basic geometry have to study Euclid. Euclid uh, um, wrote a, a book, uh, I'm talking about 300 years before Christ, so, uh, but in that book he uh, set the basis for what is Marx, uh, math today. He said uh, with a, a few assumptions and uh, some actions and propositions, he created a logic for demonstration in math. It's something that never have been done before, even when you can find names like Pythagoras. Pythagoras it, it have a, a theorem, but it never was proved until Euclid did. So <clears throat> uh, even with this series, is uh, mention his name, is uh, uh, I just trying to honor his name and to bring attention to his name. <clears throat> Here is his uh, Euclidean works. Let me see as I can put this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here. Okay. Uh, this is a, a papyrus, papyrus. How do you say that? Pap papyrus. 
uh, <coughs> I think it's the only proof that uh, existing proof that Euclid was uh, uh, alive. Um, it shows. I think it's a, 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 a translation from the Arabic. Um, this is the <coughs> the first time. This is the <coughs> the the ratio, the golden ratio. Um, it's called the, the divine proportion, golden ratio, theta, uh, many names. But he was the first person that. Express this ratio in a mathematical form. And this ratio is a, a well known. It, 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 it's appeared in nature several, several times, in spirals, especially um, in progressions, uh, in the, especially the Fibonacci progression. <coughs> And, and this code basically says that uh, if you take the O and you divide it among the biggest segment, that ratio should be equal to the biggest segment to, uh, in relation to the small segment of the line. But uh, it seems uh, simple, but it's a uh, very, very uh, complex and it appears in many many scenes in nature okay I'm sorry uh, this is uh, the, math uh, the mathematical uh, formulation um, uh, they <coughs> Greeks came with this uh, formula is called phi uh, that represents uh, basically that ratio and uh, the name Phi was uh, uh, given because uh, mentioned Phi, <laughs> Phidias, this culture that um, planned and construct the Parthenon in Greek. Uh, um, so basically, I was looking at those uh, uh, actions from Euclid's wing. <coughs> I decide to start playing with that. Um, here is my first model, um, what I call the Euclidean model. And what I did, I took two semicircles and told my software to build a body that reconciles two semicircles with a line. And that is the product of that. After I <coughs> conceived that uh, module, I start playing with and uh, trying to extract some uh, <clears throat> textures and uh, attributes to, uh, to this uh, model. Um, all those uh, te uh, textures called tessellation uh, are uh, the product of a, a software that builds surface with triangles. So all that you see is triangles. And why triangles? Because three points define a plane. So it's the minimum amount of point to define a plane. So when you define a plane, and you define a triangle too. And uh, this is not possible to, to be done with a squares or other uh, geometrical form, but a triangles. <laughs> Here, <coughs> you start seeing the, the model in different proportions already, but in this case, what I did, you can see the line, you can see two semicircles, and you, an extension of them, and a mirror. And that's it, one of the first, uh, the second model. This is an elevation of the model. And here I start, <coughs> since those are a 3D printing models, they are a little bit fragile, so I add uh, metals to uh, bring that kind of correlation between the organic forms and the man-made materials and things like that. And here you can observe the texture that is so rich 
uh, formed from that uh, tessellation. And, uh, basically, the texture, uh, the lines are the size of the triangles. And uh, in some way, they say, bring a lot of life to the model. <coughs> Because the model is so complex in space and moves so much, uh, there is many views that you can uh, get some uh, different meaning in different views. If here somebody told me it looks like it's flying, and I said that it looks to me a, 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 like it's a flying, and here like it's walking, and actually it's the same model that. It, is uh, uh, expressing in different uh, uh, contexts, right? <coughs> this is a CER model. <coughs> that's the, uh, that's me, Euclidean works number three. And uh, here you, you can observe, uh, again, the line in the middle, the mirror of uh, both parts, um, the addition of um, hardware and metals to to, bring, to make it a little bit more contemporary and to uh, <clears throat> a little bit reflect about all this uh, uh, technology of uh, this day where you can uh, mix uh, metals with uh, uh, organic things like uh, in prothesis and in pr prothesis, is that it? Uh, and this. Uh, bring all those qualities out. <coughs> this is another model that is a more uh, designed for an open space, for an atrium, for a park. Um, a mausoleum could be too. Uh, but you see, the, 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 only, the only thing I did this time was uh, split the model in the middle and they keep the line on top and the same circles on the bottom. However, the, many people don't recognize this from the first model, but it's the same that have been uh, elaborated. That's a, a, another model that I could say before that is always a, a, the same thing, the, on, the only thing that I start cutting the size. I start cutting on the sides because those planes will give me a, a position or a place to attach all these other geometries and do tiling. It's something uh, uh, that you will see more after. <coughs> Here I start creating compositions uh, with the two of the same models. Um, uh, many people see alle allegories of to human body parts, to uh, torsos, and uh, that uh, morphology or <coughs> that uh, it never appeared in my work before. But in this kind of uh, new uh, uh, 3D printing work that I'm doing. Uh, here you're going to see larger scale, <coughs> that's the Euclidean model uh, module, the first one in a large scale uh, piece. Uh, you may be able to see this piece uh, very soon here in one of these campus. Is that right? <laughs> so uh, here uh, three different views and uh, I hear a lot of things about these uh, forms, and even when came from a completely mathematical uh, concept, people start seeing bodies and relations and dance and something that I never uh, tried to imply. <coughs> uh, the interiors are. Uh, one of the most, uh, I will say, private and intimate uh, part of the sculpture, uh, especially because uh, when people go inside 
uh, chambers like that, they try to look up and see the, the light entering. So uh, for me, it's, uh, it's connecting with another level, another plane. And that's what I like from these interiors. Uh, um, I don't know, it's, uh, you see the same. Anyway, <coughs> that's another model in a large scale. Uh, actually, what I have done here is a, I use the, the, the side cuts to build a large piece and at the same time doing titling. Titling, titling, titling. Um, it's a repetition. If you see, the first model is just like that the line and the two semicircles. But it's mirror here, mirror here, and mirror like that. And that's what's. Uh, look at the detail, a uh, uh, more detailed uh, uh, part of the model. Um, a huge detail now. <coughs> I plan to build this uh, with a um, laser cut uh, um, a marine gray plywood to put it outside. The marine gray plywood uh, have a a similar texture and coloration. <coughs> um, those are uh, models to penetrate and to go through inside. Uh, of course, those only exist in reality at this uh, size. But I expect at some point to be able to make it large. Here I'm <clears throat> experimenting with uh, mm, to use the uh, the 3D printed as a, a base and know the result. Each, meaning this that I'm going to uh, model other metals on top, and at the end you won't see the 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 3D printed at all. It will be covered with an skin all around. Uh, but those are, are uh, only studies for now. Um, <coughs> uh, here you see that the, uh, no matter what, how you put the model, how you combine it, the morphology is uh, almost uh, the, uh, the typology <laughs> is the same. You can't recognize it everywhere because uh, some people say, uh, told me that this look as, as, as a face, as, as a mask, as a, uh, you know. However, uh, there is a, a common core uh, in all those pieces, and it's because it's a, a modular work. Uh, here are some other uh, configurations. This, especially these people says that it, it looks like a, you know, I don't, I, I don't think so. It's like a, a, a human body. Many people says that. Um, <clears throat> I never tried to, to do it, anything like that. And Euclid once uh, was approached by a Ptolemy. It was a pharaoh. And, told him, Euclid, uh, please, uh, I would like to learn some geometry. And um, Euclid gave him a book, a heavy, sick book uh, that he wrote called Elements. Um, two months later, the Ptolemy came and said, hey, Euclid, listen, I'm a, a king. I need a, an easy way to learn. I cannot read this. I need an easy way to learn geometry. And you, that was a useless answer. There is no royal way, way to geometry. You have to study and you have to go through. There is no other way. <coughs> in, in, in these cases, I am studying plants. Uh, uh, look how three different plants uh, from the same model. Uh, uh, those are uh, plants that I uh, study from top, so uh, imagine that the spectator go through all those uh, passages inside. Um, <clears throat> in, this in, in this case, it's only we'll be able to uh, 
reach this point, I have to come back. But in the other one, it's all what true. between two bodies have been very important. I, I, I think that uh, that's, uh, um, that influence came from Plato's uh, writings. So, um, Plato said that uh, one of the purposes in life is to find the, your missing part. So I always looking for that relation in, between two bodies. <coughs> Here are another uh, few compositions. But uh, I, I just want you to understand how many scenes you can build or arrange with one single model. The base have been the same. The, the first module that I designed have been arranged and cut and, uh, <clears throat> in different compositions. So uh, that was a, I made this uh, like a, at the beginning of the, uh, this year, but today I have a lot of other different uh, models derived from those uh, parts. Well, here <coughs> you can see my, uh, I have a small CNC in my shop where I cut the parts that I'm going to integrate to the 3D printer. Here is a, 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 a 3D printer that is a, a little bit bigger than what you have here, but it's exactly the same technology. Um, there you can see the assembly. How I assemble, I, I put the, uh, the hardware together. And <clears throat> the next is a beautiful point that I'm going to give you some time to read it from. And that's, um, she was the first, uh, I think, Pulitzer Prize. Uh, woman in poetry. Thank you very much. If anyone has questions, um, we can take them now. I just, um, I see Kay has her hand raised. So I just want to let you know that since we're recording this, I'm going to be repeating the question so everyone can hear it. Um, so please go ahead, Kay. Okay, so the question is about the logistics of creating the work in your studio and then um, how to um, place them outside. Um, so how to work and go from, a, maybe shift from a small to a large scale. Well, uh, normally my, uh, my pieces uh, assist in, in the dimension that I can fit in my uh, studio, but <clears throat> When a client comes and sees my work and likes something, I produce that a model in large scale, normally outside. Uh, in <clears throat> Sometimes we, we have to make some adjustment in technology and materials because it, it's not the same as if the piece is going to live under a roof or going to be in the elements. Uh, so, uh, normally uh, the materials uh, used outside are uh, materials that doesn't decay easily. Uh, and metals, and stone, I, I would love to make one, uh, a few of those models in marble, um, <clears throat> I think that they gonna be looks fantastic in marble. Um, you know, it's still it, it, there is a, a new materials like those polymers that I'm using now, but in reality, the the history of this culture have been uh, is in marble and metals, especially brass and bronze. 
The, when you're doing the 3D printing, um, the filament, it's made of corn, is that right? Well, I, I have several different types. I, I have a, one that uses bamboo, another uh, use uh, other um, wood fibers that I know, I don't know exactly which one, which one but uh, yes, uh, uh, all of them are recyclable and biodegradable. 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 Right. Okay. Um, we, ha we have another question from Professor Robles. Of course. Of course. So I want to see how you see the difference between the cheese of the work and the material. What's the difference? How do you see that? Okay, well, well let me repeat the question first. So the first question has to do with the relationship between painting and sculpture and the sculptural works that are displayed on the wall. And so how those two media are how Armando's interested in combining those two media in the wall works in the exhibition. Well, I, I came from the sisal. The sisal made me cry. <clears throat> um, the first time that I carved a, a, a marble, uh, I was ready to, to quit a sculpture because I hit so much my hands uh, <clears throat> with the hammer that it, I saw at some point the, the, the pain was bigger than my, my willing. But uh, I learned some techniques and I passed through. But um, uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> uh, the idea to put p pieces on the wall was uh, as simple as I fill it up all my floors and I have no place to put uh, other pieces. But they also have been the influence of other uh, sculptures um, that have done that before. And uh, I want to have words like uh, it goes to to the wall, especially for this area in New York. It's very difficult that people find it, uh, an apartment that people have the space to put on a sculpture. However, walls always are available. And what was the other question? The, the second question was about the chisel. So how does the oh uh, right the relationship between the chisel and the 3D printer and the machine in the hand? Uh, having a, a, a long, uh, I remember after the, the, the manual chisel, I started using a pneumatic, pneumatic chisel uh, that works uh, with air pressure, and after that, technology advanced so much that today I'm I'm using. Uh, uh, 3D printing, but basically uh, you have to start from a, a, when a sculpture. You have to start from the first step to clean the because uh, uh, that's what makes things uh, easy after when you know the basis strongly. Thank you. Are there any other questions? <laughs> okay, we have a question here. Thank you. So the question has to do with the placement of the artwork. So how do you come up with the idea of where to place the work, where to cite it? Well, the, the first place is uh, I put it here. 
and he, 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 he that, that girl lived there until I made it. And <coughs> when I made it, the pain of, on the scale, and the meaning of the word, I tried to find a place to. Uh, but normally, uh, people find that place for me. When they visit my studio, they say, I like this one, and they take everything. <laughs> <clears throat> but yes, uh, 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 for example, I, I would love to to do a, a science-specific project for this gallery. It's, it's very it's inspiring to have this place. But uh, uh, normally you don't work for a place like that, just for you are building a series and a volume of work that is independent to any uh, uh, science-specific. And, and we actually went through a process to um, determine the placement of the sculptures in this exhibition. We had uh -huh. a, a back and forth with Armando. What was the name of the software that you you had with the 3D models of the sculptures? Well, normally I use three different uh, uh, three different uh, uh, software. One is uh, pa parametrics to model uh, the form. After I use a, a, a rendering program to see close to reality how gonna it looks, how gonna reflect light, how gonna be the the shadows, on all those things. I study all all those things, and later on it goes to a, <clears throat> to a laser cutter or go to a three a three D printer. I have to use a software related to that machine. Uh, in in the case of 3D printer, I use a software called. It's very common and for free. A slicer. So when you put in, <coughs> import the volume in the software, the the <coughs> the software make a slice of all the 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 body, and after print layer by layer by superficial layer, <coughs> one of the other, on top of the other one. Are there any other questions? Yes, Kay. <coughs> so oh. the, the question is, what is your emotional experience after the work is complete when you're alone with it? The first things that I do, I embrace it. I, you, know, <laughs> I, it, you know, I have been touching the 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 work for very long time uh, when I'm fabricating, but there is a, a point that you give a, a, a hug and you have to go to the next one. And uh, yes, there is a, an emotional part especially when you see your work going somewhere that you, for example, France, that you don't gonna see it anymore, is a, it's like a, it's a, a little bit tough and difficult, but you know, that's, that's the way that should be. That's, that's, that's all the reason for this. Thank you. Oh, one more question from Professor Robles. The question is, who, if you were going to create these works on such a large scale, who would be the ideal viewer, one person or an entire city? I, I really work for public, always thinking in public uh, places and in young people. Uh, I, the, the idea is the, uh, to stimulate and inspire young people to keep this uh, a route and 
keep creating and keep investigating and take um, push the boundaries of art a little bit further than I, w I did or all the sculpture be before me. Because we always, uh, uh, we are preparing the way for them to express themselves. But uh, uh, yes, I, I always uh, uh, think about a lot of, I'd rather to have uh, uh, pieces outside in public uh, places than in galleries or in private collections. In private collections, only a few people, the owners see it. And, but in public space, you are uh, able to affect many people. Thank you. OK. So I, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for coming um, and um, for being with us today and to thank Armando for sharing his work with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.